when I think about money growing up, I mean, I tell people all the time, I think I, um, the biggest advantage is just two, two loving parents, um, and eventually three parents after my, my, my mom got, uh, remarried, but you know, it was a pretty normal childhood. There was not, uh, you know, my parents weren't telling me about investing or the, or the stock market or real estate or anything like that. The only thing I kind of remember is my mom, uh, just telling me to save, I guess, you know, and she kind of had a, a, a big emphasis on that, but I feel like, um, you know, almost came from a standpoint of, of scarcity to, to, to a certain extent, as far as saving with the intention of being afraid, as opposed to, you know, saving and then eventually, obviously investing for more of a abundant, positive outcome. But um, yeah, you know, not, nothing was really discussed growing up. I wasn't really like a, you know, it was a pretty normal childhood as well, as far as, I guess, sticking within the confines of, of what society you know normally is, as far as like go to school, good, good grades, um, all that kind of stuff. I wasn't an entrepreneur in any, in any sense, really. Um, I was really focused just on going to school, doing as well as I could, getting good grades, uh, you know, sticking, I guess, within the system, uh, played sports and things like that as well. But yeah, nothing, nothing really crazy where, you know, I think when a lot of people hear my eventual story, I guess that we'll, we'll tell as we go, they think, well, you know, your, your parents must have taught you about real estate or they must have taught you about the stock market or they must have taught you about, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I tell them I did get a degree in finance, but 98% of what I know, uh, you know, about personal finance investing, you know, came from after college, which is terrible considering the amount of money that's spent on a four year degree that's supposed to teach you how to do that. Um, but you know, all that came after from self education, uh, and, and experience really. So you end up getting a degree in finance. What did you imagine as you're going into college, like what your life was going to look like, the kind of job you were going to get, the kind of just the, how you thought things were going to play out as you're coming in, you know, starting college? Yeah, I guess I had really not thought too deeply into what the future exactly would look like. You know, I just thought, hey, go to college and then I'll figure out, uh, you know, what kind of job I'm going to get from there. It's funny to look back, especially now. I think I'm probably, you know, about 10, 11 years since I graduated high school. Uh, and thinking about what I, what I do now and how the last 10 years have transpired. Like, I don't think if you told that person at that time, they would have any clue or guess that I would be where I am. But, um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think I went to school with finance cause you know, and I talk about this a lot too, that we, t we make a lot of decisions, especially when it comes to finance based off of almost nothing, you know, it's just kind of what we, you know, it could be a 10 second decision. Like, why did I pick finance? I honestly, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if someone's asked me that in a long time. I think for me. It was just like, hey, finance is a good degree, I think. And I think that I can get a job and, you know, uh, in, in something banking related, investment banking, whatever. Um, but I had spent maybe 10 minutes thinking about that. And of course, you can't tell necessarily a 18 year old kid to do a ton of thinking and figure out, you know, where they're going to go for the rest of their life because a lot of things change. But um, yeah, you know, I, I think that for me, very on a very general level, it was I was going to go to college, get a degree in finance and then, you know, go into maybe some sort of banking or investment banking or something like that, um, which didn't turn out to be the case at all. But uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's how I kind of made the decision on that. So I want to preface this next question by actually reading, I'm going to click over to your website here, the first paragraph of your bio. I just think this is going to set up really well for kind of the rest of the conversation. So it says, I was a newly graduated 22 year old kid out of college with $0 to my name. I quickly learned that waking up five days a week at 6 a.m. to leave at 7 a.m. to get to work by 8 a.m. to work until 6 p.m. to get home and shower by 7.30 p.m. only to have just enough time to watch one to two episodes on Netflix before bed for the next 45 years couldn't be the life for me. So that's like one hell of a realization for a 22-year-old who's just getting started with their career. Could you kind of talk about like what prompted thoughts like that? Were you consuming content online, like YouTube, podcasts, books, or it's not common that you see a 22 year old. Start to yeah, think I, I really wasn't. I, you know, I think this was what year was that? 2015, 2016. So, um, you know, there was Instagram, but no, nothing like we know it now, you know, it's just people posting pictures of avocado toast and you know, <laughs> whatever they're, they're, they're doing you know, throughout the day, but there wasn't like educational. There wasn't people like us posting about this stuff. There might have been podcasts, but you know, it was on the very, you know, we're talking seven, eight years ago. There wasn't a lot of ton of stuff out there. But yeah, I think for me, I'm always somebody that I would consider myself uh, a high achiever or somebody that's always thought like, hey, you know, I think that I, 
uh, believe somewhat, I guess, in, in free will to where I know that if I, you know, show up and I put in the time and effort and I educate myself and I work hard and, you know, all, all the typical, you know, uh, leadership or success type of, um, you know, type of traits that I can make a better life for myself. And so I think that once I got into the real world, um, you know, like I said before, you don't do a lot of thinking uh, as to what the next steps are going to be, especially when you're a kid, 18, 22 years old. Uh, but when you go into the real world, you're forced to, to reckon with it because you're you, now you're staring down the, the barrel of you're experiencing it. Um, and it's hard to really even imagine those things in college. Um, and if I would have, maybe I would have gone on a different path sooner. But yeah, I mean, I, my job, here's the thing, like it was it was it was a great job, I guess, in, in as far as jobs go. Uh, the people were, were good. You know, it was, it was laid back atmosphere. It had an opportunity. It was, it was sales. So I wasn't, I was making $30,000 a year, uh, salary with no promise of anything more. Um, but I saw a path where I'm like, Hey, I can make more money. And that was the first thing I focused on. But, you know, like I said, in that, in that, uh, paragraph, you know, you're looking at it and you're going, is this, this is it, you know, like, this is what I, you know, I got through all of life for just to have absolutely pretty much, you know, no time to do any of the things that I, uh, enjoy, uh, you know, and so um, I started looking for, I guess, a way out. So that's what kind of led me on a journey to first and foremost, just consume everything I possibly could about personal finance, which, like I said, wasn't necessarily through Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or, uh, you know, Google or any of those kind of things. Now it was more so just books, um, specifically audio books. I had a uh, 30, 45 minute commute, like one way. So an hour and a half, um, uh, you know, round trip and five days a week. And so I don't know, that's six, seven hours right there. Um, and so I popped in, you know, books on audio books and I would put it on, you know, uh, at the beginning one X speed by the end, it was like, you know, two X speed, which just sounds like you're, you're playing a tape in reverse, but, um, <laughs> I get to the point where I could read pretty much a book a week, you know? So I was reading 50, 60 books a year, you know, and to be honest, as you guys probably know, I think that if you read, I could probably give you like five books right now that if you read them and fully understood them, it's almost all you really need to know. Um, and I think that's the, that's the, the sad part and, and the, it's the, it's the good, it's the bad news and it's the gospel at the same time is that most people aren't really that far away from, from the information they need to know in order to be successful when it comes to personal finance, investing, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the hard part is really, uh, you know, day in and day out staying consistent with the information that you've learned. But, um, so yeah, for me in the beginning it was more so focused on how can I consume all this information, and then, you know, uh, of course piece by piece over time it was how can I take this and put it into action, you know, over the course of my, you know, for me I didn't I didn't in the beginning I didn't know that I was going to retire in six seven years I had no that wasn't even my goal I was just like hey I want to learn I want to start doing these things and then I think the cool thing about learning and education and getting around people that are doing the same thing. It, it, it kind of, uh, you know, hyper focuses you and there's almost a, a compound interest, if you will, or a snowball effect to what you think is possible for your life. Uh, you know, the more you accomplish, the more you realize that you haven't, that you haven't really accomplished what your, your potential is, you know? And so, but it takes getting up step by step up that ladder. You know, it's almost like a winding staircase. You know, you can't really see steps four, five, and six until you get up to step, step three, you know? Uh, and so taking action, I always say like action begets action. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, it was education starting to take action. And then the more I learned and the more I acted, the more opportunities, uh, presented itself from there. Yeah. I love that you call out that, Hey, you know, if you read probably five books and really understood it, that that might be all you needed to, to make, to find success. And I think that's probably a problem we see a lot is there's so much information out there that, and you can always find a counter argument. So you can kind of sit there and get stuck in analysis and figure out which way should I really go instead of actually taking any action. But one thing we love to do is walk in listeners exactly through your story, you know, like year one, like you, that first job, you mentioned Thirty thousand dollars salary. Like, what year was that? And then, what since it was a sales job? Like, looking back on that first year, how much money were you making? Because I know we'll want to un uncover how you were able to also progress in your nine to five career and, and see those large increases. Because that's a reality for a lot of people that could be a huge change of their life if they can just figure out a way to get an extra 10, 20 percent of the salary that they're working at. Yeah. So, and, and I, I teach a lot of people this, I guess, in my master class. Cause as soon as I say sales or some, you know, people automatically put up some sort of flag, like, well, I'm not a salesperson or sales isn't for me. What I would tell people is that you don't know if sales is, isn't for you until you do it. It's just, it's just a skill like anything else that can be, 
that can be learned. Some of the best salespeople I've ever known are the people that you would think would be the worst salespeople, to be honest, the so introverts, people like that, that you wouldn't think their skill set really lends to that. Um, so I'll start with that. Um, and two, there's a lot of other ways to, to, you know, raise your income. It doesn't have to be sales. Sales was just my way. It's my story. So, um, you know, for me, I saw it as a way to, again, the better I did, if I, if I believe that I'm somebody that can work harder than other people. And I, and I believe that, um, you know, the better that I do, I want to be able to be rewarded for that. So, uh, if I work, go to work a job and it's a salary job, it doesn't matter if I'm a three out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, I'm still getting paid the same thing. Uh, for me, that just doesn't add up. You know, and I think, you know, where, where does that come from? Probably from as a kid, just playing sports and being competitive and things like that. I think that I'm always, I've always have had a, some sort of competitive mentality. Uh, and it's not necessarily about trying to make more money to be better than other people, but it was kind of like, Hey, if I'm putting all this time and effort in, I just want to be fairly compensated for my time. Um, and I like the idea of being able to build right. Um, to where, you know, it, over time you can make more and more and more, as opposed to waiting on your boss to maybe give you a 3% raise, 5% raise a year, you know, like that, it's hard to build wealth like that. Um, and so even though I, I didn't have the whole picture together at the beginning, as far as like, Hey, I'm going to get a sales job because I know that I'm going to need money to invest in stocks, real estate, and all this stuff down the road. For me at the beginning, I just knew, Hey, I want to, I need a track to make a lot of money. I don't know exactly why yet or how I'm going to, to grow that. Um, so that's another thing. People, people hear my whole story and they'll go, well, you know, how did you do all that at once? Like I didn't do all of it at once. Like I, in the beginning, I focus on, on keeping my expenses low and, and making money. And that, that was, that was one, like, you know, step one, figure that out. Um, and then once you have money to invest, then figure out how, then figure out how to invest. But if you don't have any money to invest and why are you worried about real estate or the stock market or, or this or that, like if it, you know, focus on your cash flow first for me. Um, and so in that first year I was, I, my starting salary was 30,000. I probably made 60,000 by the end of that first year. Uh, and the second year was hundred thousand, then 150, then 200, then 250, then 300, um, over the course of the seven, seven years from 2000 and, 15, 16 to 2022, uh, before I left this, this past year. Um, and so, yeah, it gave me an opportunity to, um, you know, scale my income quickly. Right. And, and as a result, scale my cash flow quickly. I kept my expenses, not like, uh, you know, low, 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 like coupon, like type lifestyle on purpose. But for me, it was more of a focus on how can I make more money and, and need less, uh, you know, to, to, to live and be happy or whatever, and take that money and start using it to fund my freedom. So that was kind of the, the beginning for me, uh, from an income perspective. So jumping over to the expense side of things, like, were you house hacking? Were you driving an old car? Like, I guess how, and over the course of those years, like your income sounds like it's doubling every year. Most people who go from 60 K to 300 K in six years, probably are, you know, they're driving a BMW and they're renting like a penthouse suite and they're doing all this crazy stuff because their income has just skyrocketed. What did it look, what did it look like for you over those? Uh, well, I think in years? the very, very beginning, you know, there's almost like phases where I, you know, I, I think lifestyle creep is something that can, like you said, you know, when you go up, especially when you go up that quickly, um, you know, and your expenses can sometimes follow you. And then you get in a situation where arguably you're almost worse off than when you started is you lose your job and then you've got a, you know, million dollar house and, you know, a hundred thousand dollar car and, and then no job. Right. Um, and you know, for me in the beginning, again, I was making $30,000. So I was like, there, there, there is no real like spending or in that first year, first two years to kind of get, get me off my, my feet. Um, luckily for me, well, unluckily I didn't know about house hacking. I didn't know about real estate at that time. Um, cause if I did, that's probably where to been my focus to try to save up for a property, do that first. Uh, but I had, I guess the next best thing. So I was actually the RA, uh, like a, like a resident advisor at my, at my college. I lived in a, in a fraternity house and because I served in the fraternity as a president and in these different things, um, there was an opportunity that came up to be the house dad, which is the best and worst thing I guess they probably ever happened to me trying to start your career while still living in a fraternity house. Uh, but what it allowed me to do was not pay rent. So I didn't pay rent for the first two years that I had, a, you know, I was making over six figures by the time I ever had to pay for rent. 
Um, and you know, they paid for electricity, utilities, a stipend. Uh, I was getting paid to live, you know, so it really was almost like a house hacking, except you don't, you don't get a, you know, appreciation and depreciation and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it allowed me to, I didn't have a car payment. I, I didn't have a housing payment. Um, you know, the only thing I was really spending money on was maybe groceries, you know, uh, six, seven years, seven, eight years ago when they were you know, affordable, uh, to go to the grocery store. <laughs> and, buy stuff. Uh, and so for me, I mean, I don't know, my expenses were, I don't even know if they were a thousand dollars like a month, you know, it was like just the, the bare necessities really. Uh, and then as time went on, you know, I upgraded a little bit, but upgrading would just be, Hey, I moved into a one bedroom apartment with, with my girlfriend, you know, that was like, eleven hundred a thousand eleven hundred dollars a month when yeah my friends were making half as much as i was living in a twenty five hundred dollar a month downtown apartment or whatever um and you know for me like i said i always had that idea where for the, the first and foremost i guess to back up a step was you can't take a thirty thousand dollars a year job if you're if if your expenses are too high to begin with. And also if I wasn't doing the, I, I could have easily said, screw this. I don't want to live in a fraternity house. And, 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 you know, that would, there'd be a lot of <laughs> reasonable reasons to, to come up to that conclusion. But, um, you know, I easily could have moved downtown, but if I would have moved downtown, what would have happened to me? Well, I would have had to go probably take a 50, $60,000 a year job. that was maybe salary. And so uh, three, four years down the road, I, I just, I wouldn't even be in the spot just from that one decision right there. Cause everything connects, you know? Because I had no expenses, because I was willing to maybe live in a somewhat crappier situation, uh, you know, and not have rent and, and get the stipend and not have these expenses, it allowed me to take a bigger risk on a job that I didn't know if it was going to work or not. Because people hear thirty thousand, you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, but not one cent of that was ever promised, you know, from the beginning, and, and that easily could have been thirty thousand dollars. And then I didn't make enough, I didn't make any sense of commission and I flunked out and failed or I got into a bad market or bad industry or bad timing. Uh, there's a million other things that could happen, but because I kept my expenses low, it allowed me to raise my risk profile, which ended up being the, you know, the main driver of, of me getting out of, of the rat race. And I know you mentioned like to start, you, it wasn't really crossing your mind. Like, Hey, I might retire in six or seven years. At what point in your journey did you start to think like, you know what, this whole like early retirement thing is actually possible. Like, I think I can reach this. Uh, you know, I, I think like it was just about it, which it always is just about the fundamentals. You know, like I said, in the beginning it was like, make more, make more, you know, uh, not necessarily spend less, but at least have a spending plan that's in alignment with where you're trying to get to when you're trying to get to it. Um, but after like three or four years, yeah, it, it's funny when I think back because I remember like when I first got my job, I'm like, if I can just make a hundred thousand dollars, like that's it, like that's life, like I, I'll be I'll be good and happy forever. Um, and that happened within like a year or two. Um, and I think after like three years, three four years, and I was starting to make like a hundred and fifty, and I was starting to invest a lot, you know, like over five thousand a month or maybe even more at that point, depends on exactly what we're talking. Um, and I started getting into real estate, started learning about real estate. And so I'd already built up a, you know, a large amount of, of stock investments and I started getting into real estate. And then I saw it as, Hey, like if I can just kind of lock down a, you know, a few properties over the course of, again, at that time, who knows, like 10, 15 years, like I can probably retire by the time I'm 40. And, you know, and then one thing led to another uh, as time went on. And then I started to kind of, like I said, as I got further up the staircase, I started realizing the staircase wasn't as tall as I thought it was. <laughs> hmm. So even though you're in sales and I don't know exactly what percentage of our listeners are in sales or have been in sales, but I think there's going to be a lot of like parallels that they can draw to their own journey, whether they're entrepreneurs or just in a different day job. What made you a good salesperson? Like were you just out calling or I don't know exactly how the reach out worked or like, were you just doing the double the volume of everyone else? Were you like, did you have a better script? Were you just better closer? I'm just, I'm just kind of curious, like from a tactical level, how you were scaling your income so quickly. Yeah. The so the there, there's a couple of different, I guess, ways. So the industry that I was in specifically was healthcare staffing. So you, you basically place healthcare professionals in ongoing travel jobs. Um, and so the beginning I had a job, it's called recruiter. So you're the person that actually goes out and calls the, the nurse and you deal with the, the nurses. You might have 10 or 15, 20 working for you at one point. 
Uh, and for that, that was more of a, um, like a lower ceiling type of position. And so the first thing that I did was I did really well at that. And it, it was, it was, I don't want to say it's like gruntier work, but it was, it was, it, it was, it was gruntier. I don't know how else to say it, but, uh, it was tough. You know, it, it was, it was an absolute grind. You're, you're, you're dealing with, you know, uh, business to business sales. Like there's at least a, a, a level of decorum. Uh, you know, like when you can speak to each other, how you speak to each other, how often you speak to each other, uh, when you're dealing with like, uh, placing doesn't not necessarily just nurses, but anybody, right. You're always going to get people, um, uh, you know, that might be tougher to deal with and they don't have the same set of rules. Cause it's just a personal business relationship as opposed to dealing with someone that works for a company. But, um, so for me, the first thing was I got out of that role within a year and I moved into what they call sales, which is more so dealing with the hospitals, dealing with, um, you know, opening up new contracts um, and dealing with the client side of things. And on that side in this business, there's a much higher ceiling for uh, to, to make more money because you're not dealing with each nurse. Uh, you know, you I might have 50 nurses working for me, but there's 10 recruiters that that split between and they're the ones that deal with the nurses, which is the more time intensive um part of the business and I'm dealing more so just with like higher level stuff, opening up new contracts, dealing with current existing contracts, stuff like that. Um, and so you can build what's called a desk, uh, which is just like your, your ongoing business. And so it wasn't like every first of the month I started over and was like, all right, you know, cause there would be a compound interest in that kind of business from, from just your skill set going up. Um, but there was also not only my skill set going up, but you're also, uh, you have current existing business, or nurses that are working there. So I was able to build that up over time to where I never like, you know, even if I didn't work theoretically for a month or two, I'd probably still make almost about the same amount until, you know, eventually it would, it would, it would fall off, you know, cause they're ongoing like three month contracts for most part. Um, but for me, the first thing was moving into a better role within the company to where I could see a uh, more of a yellow brick road, we'll call it uh, as far as like getting me to where I want to go. Uh, and so that's what I, I tell a lot of people, a lot of times, whether it's sales or anything, um, you know, you got to be really careful about where the ceilings are uh, and how many people get there and uh, what mm. percentage of people get there. Cause you might get into a role where you're like, Oh, well, this person's making a hundred thousand dollars. Well, how long have they been working there? You know, what, what, what kind of, you know, how many hours a week are they working? Uh, you know, how many other people are doing it? Cause you might find, well, this guy works 90 hours a week. He's the only one in the company that makes the amount that you want to make. And it took him 10 years of, you know, working there to get there. And so those would all be like strike, strike three, like this is a bad idea. Um, and so doing all that work on the front end, as far as like seeing the path of getting to where you want to get to um, is, is important. But for me, it was promotion. And then from there, that, that business is kind of like uh, a war of attrition in a way. There's a, it's a high turnover with people within the company. And so, you know, if you stick through there, you know, you might gain other people's territory after they leave or after they quit or whatever. Uh, and so it's just a lot of that. On top of that, as far as the, the strategies of how I get, maybe got there from, from sales was, you know, really a lot of the, the typical boring stuff as far as, you know, showing up early, putting in the extra effort, you know, looking at my numbers and, you know, trying to dive into, you know, a daily journal as far as what went right, what went wrong, you know, and as far as what went right, why did it go right? What went wrong? What can be improved? I think that right there is like really all you need in anything in time, you know, to, to figure these things out. If you want to get better at anything, you know, you just, you just write down, you know, working out or, or whatever, you know, what went right? What went wrong? Where can I improve? You know, do I have, you know, what resources or people, you know, in some situations do I need to help make that happen? Uh, you know, if I can't do it, who can do it? Uh, or, you know, uh, you know, something like that. And, uh, the, the last thing was really just investing in the people around me. Um, in the beginning, it was more so of looking at the people ahead of me that were in the roles that I wanted to be in and asking myself what, you know, and asking them, you know, what, what are, what are you guys doing to get there? And what are you doing on a daily basis? How do you do things? What do you think, you know, is the two things you do on a daily basis out of 2 million that make all the difference? Um, and trying to, to take that together and, and work those things in. I always say you need three people in your life. You need people that are above you that you can learn from. You need people at your level that you can compete and collaborate with, and you need people below you that you can, A, practice practice your teaching, which I think is the best way to learn anything, and also to help bring up people uh, and help their journey be a little bit faster, a little bit easier than yours. Um, and so, yeah, I had people on my level as well, 
that I talked to a lot. And then there was people underneath me. And I think that was the biggest thing because the way that it was set up was recruiters went out, they got, you know, got the nurses and had them apply to your jobs and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm kind of, I guess the middleman where everything kind of, they, they go do that work and then it runs through me. So I'm talking to them every single day. And even though I'm not necessarily their boss, the recruiters, um, I'm a more senior level person. I've been in their role before. Um, and so anytime they would go to me and, and maybe some of them didn't like me for doing this uh, or thought it was annoying, but I would try to coach them through, like, if something didn't go right, I'd be like, Hey, like, you know, not like, well, I'm better than you. This is how you should do it every time. But like, Hey, you know, this is like an issue to happen. Obviously I know that you don't want this person to back out of this job. You know, what happened trying to dive into it and, and that made them better. So the next time they came around, there would be less uh, issues. It also meant that they'd be more likely to maybe try to push their people to my jobs because they had a better relationship with me. Um, and I just think it makes the business together, uh, b business better uh, as a whole. So those are a lot of things I guess I did across, uh, you know, many different levels to try to succeed or push my income through being better at sales. Earlier, you kind of mentioned how things go in a different way could have meant that you ended up in a completely different position, which I don't know that we all give enough credit to like some of those lucky bounces, some of those things that get us in the right position. And I'm also always fascinated at how there's all these different industries and jobs that you just never even heard of. And then you hear somebody talk about it. It's like, Oh, wow, that sounds like a, you know, like a great position to be in. So how did you actually end up in this position in the first place? Like what, how did this job like kind of come to you? Yeah, I, w I wish I could say it was like this thing I'd really been researching for a long time because that's what I tell people to do now. But um, I went to a career fair my, I guess, senior year, and I really just wanted to start like working and getting experience doing something. And I went to a career fair and it was, um, excuse me, one of my friends, um, his his like older brother that was there and he worked for this company. It's funny because he's like, I just started talking to him because I know him. And you know, I'm like, what's, you know, what's this company you work for? And he's like, uh, you know, it's national staffing. And I'm like, what do you guys do? And he's like, oh, I don't know. He's like, well, I kind of know, but I just started here like a week ago. I'm like, cool. You got like, you guys hiring? Like I'm trying to get an internship <laughs> for like this last fall before I graduated. Um, and I still at that time thought like maybe, you know, I was still looking for other positions and banking and stuff like that. Like I was talking about, uh, but I worked there for three months and, you know, three, four months, something like that before I graduated. And again, I, I kind of got in there, met people like kind of understood. I, I had no idea that the industry even existed prior to, to being there. Um, but I saw it as an opportunity, like I said, to where I could see people scaling their income. Uh, and I was like, you know what, this, like, I'm going to give this a shot. And, you know, the way that I describe it is I, I had a healthy level of, um, you know, uh, being, being skeptical about it, I guess, um, you know, but the time I put in, it just got consistently, but as I showed you or told you guys the numbers before, it just got better and better and better and better. Um, and I always was like, I don't even know if I'm, this is what I'm gonna do long term. but as I got closer and, and, you know, up to 150, 200, 250,000, and I was investing at this time and buying real estate, I started the, the whole picture started to become clear of like, why? And I was like, I'm not going to jump out of this career, you know, at this point. Cause I'm like, I'm probably one, two years away from not, you know, not, not like retiring, retiring, but just being able to live whatever life I want to live. Right. And so it became more of a mathematical equation. I'm like, I'm going to stay in this until I can, uh, you know, get that kind of stuff situated and then, and then move out from there. So you just mentioned investing and that's something we have not talked about yet in today's episode. And so as you start to increase your income, I know you mentioned at some point you're like putting $5,000 a month into, I don't know if it was the stock market you mentioned at that time. But what did the investment progression start to look like as the as the income climbed? But you said your expenses. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, well. in that, I mean, I was even investing probably when I was making thirty thousand dollars because there was I didn't really have any expenses at all. So, you know, obviously it didn't start off at five thousand dollars. I think that's what's important that you know people get these. Uh, they see the the charts of like what they need to be investing to get you know there by a certain time. And the important part is just to start and improve. You know, that's that's the only two things. Uh, and so for me, you know, it started off with probably, you know, hundred dollars a month, maybe. Um, and then that progressed to well over 10, tens of thousand, 10,000 plus, you know, maybe even 15, 20,000, some, some months, uh, investing by the end of it. 
you know, in the beginning that was mostly, well, it was all focused on the stock market uh, because I didn't have knowledge of real estate at that point by the time, you know, when I was 22, 21 to 26. Um, and then once I learned about real estate, then I started, you know, moving money more towards that uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of how the progression went over time. You know, I learned about real estate when I was 25, 26 from reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which it, I explain to people is the, it's the best book that doesn't teach you absolutely anything at all. Uh, you know, it's more so like kind of a, <laughs> like the financial freedom, rah, rah, like motivational book. And you read it and you're like, I'm about to go take on the world. And then you're like, wait, what do I do? Uh, you know, cause it doesn't really teach you how to do anything. It's just more about talking about kind of the concepts, but it's really great. It's on everybody's list, you know, top five, you know, you know, classic books when it comes to it. And I, I will credit it for sure to kind of getting me started into, you know, di- pulling out some other books and other, you know, other ideas and talking to people about, all right, how do I actually do this? Um, but that's kind of how that transition started. And at what point did it go from just you trying to learn as much as you can to realizing, Hey, I've got a lot of knowledge to share and where you wanted to start actually teaching other people. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I had become, uh, and I guess the, this is probably the opposite process. Most people get on social media and become a millionaire and then teach people how to become a millionaire through ways that aren't social media. Um, I, I had become a millionaire prior to even getting on social media through all the things that we're talking about now, you know, from A to Z, you know, budgeting, increasing income, understanding the rest of it, debt, credit, savings, everything else that comes with kind of a basic foundational finance. Um, and then stocks, real estate, um, and stocks and real estate, pretty much the, you know, that, that combination there. And so I got to a point where it was COVID. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word or not, but, um, it was in the middle of <laughs> like probably that summer. Right. So a few months had gone by everybody. I stayed in the office with my boss. I don't even know why we stayed, but everybody else went home. I think we kind of thought, cause I, he was number one. I was kind of number two in charge. And we kind of thought like, you know, let's just stick together. If we, you know, go home, it's just, everything's going to fall apart, whatever. Um, but I had a lot more time on my hands cause our business was all about, you know, it's almost not like Wolf of Wall Street at all, but people are, are, you know, it's very interactive. People are screaming back and forth. Hey, what is going on? I need this, da, 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 whatever. Uh, and when everyone's gone, you know, and you call someone and then they don't pick up the phone then you're just like sitting there like, all right, you know, like what do I do now? So there's a lot of in between time. And I just started doing a lot of thinking and I did this one, uh, you know, journaling exercise it's called the wheel of life or something like that. And you basically rate yourself one to 10, all these different areas, um, you know, business, relationship, friends, fun, et cetera. And the one that kept staring back at me was contribution. And I didn't feel like I gave myself like a one or a two. I didn't feel like I was really contributing anything necessarily to society. I felt like I was contributing, you know, my work through helping people and, you know, contributing in my, you know, family and community and stuff like that, but not really to the extent. And I kind of had the idea like, Hey, I've got all this incredible information that I've basically learned and put into action and had a lot of success with. I'm just going to start posting about it uh, online without any idea or thought that it was going to turn into a business. Um, and obviously, you know, two years and 200 something thousand followers later, you know, it's a, it's a much different story, but it just came with really, Hey, I want to help. I want to give back. I want to talk about a lot of these things that I've done in the hopes that it helps people. If it takes off great, if it doesn't, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm do, just doing this kind of, I guess for, for fun anyways. Yeah. And one of the reasons I love your content so much, I think we kind of talked about it earlier a bit, but you focus a lot on increasing income. And obviously that was like a key part of your story. If you were just working some salary job, where you got like an 8% raise every year, Tyler, there's no way you would have accumulated the wealth that you accumulated. If you started at 60 K and then, you know, six years later, maybe you're making like 85 or 90, but I know like with your content, you focus a ton on increasing in- on increasing income. I was wondering if you could just talk about that for a second. Like, obviously we've kind of fleshed it out with your story, but why should other people be focusing so much on increasing their income rather than like couponing or like extreme budgeting or other methods to financial yeah, independence? Yeah, well, I mean, I think freedom? everybody on a base level understands that like, you know, especially now with inflation, like the, you, you, you can't live off nothing. Like you have, there's always a base level of expenses. Um, and the cool part is that if I'm given like a quick example, no taxes involved for the, for the sake of my sanity, but let's say, you know, you're, you're making, you know, $6,000 and, uh, 
uh, you know, your expenses are $4,000. So you, you're, you're investing $2,000. If you raise your income, you know, up to $10,000 and you still have, what was it? $4,000 in expenses. Now your, your income didn't double, but your investments tripled because there's that base level. You, your, your investments went from 2000 a month, to 6,000 a month, which is tripling, but your income only went from 6,000 a month to 10,000 a month, which isn't even doubling. Right. So it, because there's a base level that you have to, to live off of um, and whether that's two or three or four or five, it depends on a lot of different factors. But the thing is that once once you start raising your income, um, it's it's incredibly, you know, uh, more valuable and, and more efficient, obviously, to 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 your goals, because you're able to um, invest everything that's over that threshold because your expenses are already taken care of. So as you go up, you know, unless you lifestyle creep, which you shouldn't do, uh, at least not fully. Um, there's absolutely no reason that you should make four thousand more dollars and your expenses go up by one dollar necessarily, um, which which allows you a lot of power. Which is kind of why I did what I did. Um, and I think just once you understand that, you know, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, easy for you to say, go make more money." Um, you know, that's that's like a you know a novel concept, right? But I think there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think that you know a lot of people go, "Oh well, you know, I don't want to just go chase money." And I'm like all right, cool. Like, do you like your job now? And they're like, no. I'm like, well then, so you're at a job that you hate and it's not paying you well. So it's like, <laughs> what's what, where, you know, what benefit are you getting? You know? So I think like doing a lot of research, I tell everybody that goes to my masterclass and like, we have people that are making $30,000 a year. People that are in college. We have doctors that are making $300,000 a year. You know, and, and, and everywhere in between, I tell people like, regardless, whoever you are, wherever you are, you need to look at your career and this doesn't mean that you're going to change or quit or, or throw away everything you've ever done, but just think about it. Start thinking about it. Start asking yourself, am I doing what I want to be doing? Is it paying me what I, what I need to be paid? And once you understand like how much you need to invest and you know, how many properties you need to, to buy and what kind of cash flow numbers you need or how much you need to invest per month in the stock market to retire, you start to understand I have to be, you know, at some point I have to be investing two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month or whatever to get to my goals within the given time frame, because that's all a math equation for the most part. And so when you understand those numbers and then you go and you look at your job and it's just like, it's not adding up. Well, it's not adding up. Like you got to scrap it. You got to start looking at, Hey, what kind of, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean going back to college. Um, it could be getting another skill, uh, getting into a different industry, maybe getting in, you know, you could be in the right industry in the right job, but with a, a crappy commission structure, if you're in sales, so it could be getting into a different company within the same industry, doing what you do with a better commission structure. Um, so it's always important to kind of look at these things and ask yourself. Uh, I always tell people, you know, I, I don't know if anyone else has ever said this. This is probably like my catchphrase. Uh, if, if, um, if I have one, hopefully no one else has said this because if so, then I got nothing that makes me unique, but uh, <laughs> I always tell people there's no right or wrong decisions. <laughs> Uh, there's only aligned and unaligned decisions. You know, I think a lot of times people try to get into an industry or a field or go to college or not go to college or pay off their debt or not pay off their debt or invest in the stock market or not invest in the stock market. Uh, and none of those are right or wrong decisions necessarily, you know, cause it's, it's all about who you are, what your goals are, when you're trying to get to where you're trying to get to, why you're trying to get there. Uh, and all those could be an aligned decision or an unaligned decision. So, I think that, you know, for me in the, in the income piece, it's very important to make sure that whatever you're doing is aligned with where you're trying to go and the life that you're, that you're trying to live um, and trying to find, Hey, is it going to be, uh, and I, I call this kind of like my income stack. Like you, you have to have one source of income that, that's active, like a job, whatever. Uh, and you have to have at least one outside of it, whether it's the stock market, real estate, otherwise there's, you know, you know, the only money that's coming in is active. So you stop working. There's no money, money. You can never retire. Right. Uh, but that can look a lot of different ways, right? You know, it could be someone that is working a nine to five, you know, a salary job and they're putting money in the stock market with a goal to retire in 30, 35 years. It could be somebody that is working a, a sales job with, you know, it's heavy commission and they're um, putting it into real estate, whether that be long-term or short-term. Uh, and so they've got their active income and they've got their source of passive income. And obviously you can stack that many different ways. Could even be a salary job plus a side hustle. Um, and maybe that side hustle turns into a full-time hustle, right? So I like to, to expand people's thoughts because I think people are just like, well, I go work this job. It does, you know, I make whatever they tell me I make. Uh, and then I just like invest in my 401k and like that's the only way. 
and you know not necessarily right so i think that once you you know become a little bit more creative with how you're thinking about income and where that could possibly come from and different sources that could come from uh it's all about trying to create that income stack that is uh you know going to be in alignment with where you're trying to get to yeah completely agree with with your catchphrase and i similarly tell people you know there's nothing that i'm going to tell you you should or should not buy for instance like if it's a car if that's what you really want like i don't care if that's what you buy it's like i just want to make sure you're informed and you know what you just did to your future self like do you understand what you're doing to your future self if you're cool with that if it's not a big deal if it works within your plan all good like no big deal um as far as like some of the you know job progression you know the the stuff that you've seen with maybe some of your clients or as you've been teaching people this is there some common themes you've seen that work as far as helping people increase their income? Like, is it mostly looking at outside jobs or are there things internally they do with their own in their within their own jobs without having to leave that, that you've seen be successful to increasing income? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of different categories. And again, uh, it's all situationally uh, dependent on exactly what kind of job you're in. Um, I think that one, you know, raises people, people don't, really don't even ask for them to be honest, or they just wait and wait till the end of the year and they hope that they get it. Um, And I I look at raises very differently. I I think you should be asking about, and and some people like, you know, might sound like, Oh, what'd you just say? I think you should start the conversation in an interview and the way that looks, it's a more proactive approach where, you know, you get through the job or job interview and you answer the question, whatever, but Hey, you know, obviously as I'm going throughout my career uh, you know, I'm interested in progressing, not only, uh, skill wise, but also financially over time, do you guys have a process for, you know, reviewing performance at the end of the year, as well as potential salary and or bonus and or commission increases, right? And, and that's not a crazy question to ask. I think that's all everybody would say that's reasonable. But what you're looking for is, oh, no, we don't have any process like that. All right, I would probably shut my computer or maybe maybe tell them buy first. But you know, if they don't <laughs> even have any sort of process, like you know what you're walking into. But a lot of people <laughs> walk into these positions because they don't know on the front end that it's – everything's appropriate to ask in, in the right way for the most part, right? Um, and that's an example. And then once you get in there, it's more about, you know, once you once you start the job, hey, you know, um, you're talking to your boss, say, say same exact script. Hey, I want to put myself in the best possible situation so that when we have this conversation that you guys told me about in the interview process before that I was proactive about in six to 12 months from now, what are the things that you would like to see that I have accomplished in order for me to put myself in the best possible situation to get that race? All right, X, Y, Z, da, 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 whatever, right? Then you go do X, Y, Z things over the next six, 12 months, whatever. You come back in that in that interview and you say, Hey, remember when we talked about those things and you said that you know, in order to get you know, X, Y, Z raise, you wanted me to be able to do ABC things. Well, I did ABC things. And not only that, I, you know, I did, you know, better than all those things and additional things, whatever. Right. And that puts you in a situation where it'd be really, you know, stupid for your boss to say, all right, well, we're not going to give you the raise, even though I told you what I wanted, you got it for me and I did it and I'm not giving it to you. Um, and then, and if they do say no, then you know you're probably in the wrong place too, right? Where, where if somebody says, hey, go do this, you go do it, and maybe even excel and do even better, and then they don't follow through on their end of the promise, you know, then then you've kind of got your answer there as well. So I think a more proactive approach to raises. Um, and also, you know, the average raise in 2022 was like 3%. Like when you stay at the same company, the average raise when you went to a different company was 15% last year. Um, is it always going to be like that? I don't know. Um, you know, it depends on the job market, but I think it's always a good idea to do research, right? You, th- like a lot of the stuff is, I mean, everything is free, right? You know, going on pay, uh, pay scale and uh, salary.com and, all, and Glassdoor, all these different websites and saying, okay, what is somebody in my role with my years of experience in my, you know, uh, industry, or whatever, what are they making, right? And you might, you might see a big discrepancy. So you can either take that to your company and say, hey, this is what people are getting paid in my industry. Uh, they might say, cool, don't care. Right. Then, then you can start applying for these other jobs and interview with these other jobs. Um, and you know, always be looking to not necessarily job hop every, every year necessarily, but if it's in a, if you're in a situation, sometimes that can be the best idea, uh, to continue to progress from a raise standpoint, if you don't have control over it from the, uh, like from it being a salary type of role. So, I think just, you know, always, you know, using strategies like that to always, you know, not 
try to control things as much as you can or put them within your control as opposed to, you know, I mean, that's, that's really life. But, you know, the more you put your success in someone else's hands, the least, the less successful you're, you're, you're going to be. It's just, you know, like no one cares about you or your life or your success the way you do. No one, no one cares about, you know, people that try to make a business and then hire someone to run it. it usually doesn't work out well. Why? It's no one, no one cares about you and your life or your business or whatever as much as you do. Right. So you've got to be your biggest fan and your biggest, uh, you know, uh, you know, cheerleader to go out there and, and figure out, all right, how am I going to do this? Well, for the people who are looking for the support on how to do this and increasing income and reaching financial freedom, I know you mentioned before, Tyler, like you went from not creating anything online to now hundreds of thousands of followers across social media. Where do you want to point listeners? Like where's the best place for them to follow along, get in touch? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on TikTok. So it just kind of depends on where you hang out. Um, You can search the words defining wealth. Um, Created that a a, a while ago. Uh, The the name and the, the thought behind it, which is funny most people look at their, their, their name now and they're like, that was a dumb idea. I wish I could change it now. Um, but the idea is that I'm not giving you the definition of wealth. Um, it's not past tense. I'm helping you, uh, pro at, or, or, you know, currently define wealth. So we're defining what wealth is and helping you get there as soon as possible. Um, so I'm on Instagram under that. I'm on TikTok. I'm on, uh, Twitter, basically anything. And, and, uh, what you can do is if you're interested in, uh, I've got a lot of free resources. I've written like, you know, eBooks and videos and, uh, free courses and stuff like that. If you're kind of, you know, want to get to know me a little bit more, um, I also go live and stuff like that. So it's a good opportunity to, to listen more and hear me teach and stuff like that. Um, if you're ready to kind of take the next step and join like a financial freedom masterclass or something like that, I do them every, every couple of months. I have one coming up in March. Uh, and you can find out more info on that. If you're interested at the, at the link in any of my, my bios on, on social media. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. It's a very impressive story and love that you're taking what you've learned and going back out there and teaching others. Yeah, I I appreciate you guys having me on. I, you know, I could probably sit here for three hours, but I know that, uh, we got to (laughs) kind of keep these to a, you know, 45 minute hour window, but I, you know, anytime you guys ever, you know, want to talk about anything, I'd be more than happy to come back on. 